All right, so I uh, I just got a response from Nobel physicist Brian Josephson, who uh, asked me about Basil J. Hiley's paper on uh, how thinking, how one thought flows into the other thought, and uh, Professor Hiley. He uses the same analogy of the flowing of, uh, in music, and so I just found this link. I had I've not never seen this before, but I I was just talking. I corresponded with Professor Hiley recently about uh, math professor Lou Kaufman, Lou Kaufman who worked with Eddie Oceans and Eddie Oceans trained in uh, Wing Chun. And realize the secret of um, non-Western philosophy as uh, alchemy is due to non non commutativity. So there's a direct connection now between Eddie Ocean's training in uh, internal martial arts and Lou Kaufman's collaboration with Eddie Ocean's, and then. Professor Basil J. Hiley citing Lou Kaufman, and then my own um, correspondence with Professor Hiley about Alain Kahn's non commutative quantum algebra, who rely and Kahn's relies on music theory, the same music theory concept that I had discovered on my own when I was a teenager. And uh, now Professor Hiley is working on a new paper about Alain Kahn's. Along con and so I'm hoping that uh, Professor Brian Josephson takes an interest in um, Basil J. Hiley because Brian Josephson has also he asked me originally about his own music uh, compositions and that's how I got uh, conversing originally with Nobel physicist Brian Josephson, and that was back about five years ago. Uh, around the same time, I contacted Professor Hiley, and I've been about the same topic of time and frequency being non-commutative. So I have been corresponding with both um, Professor Hiley and Professor and uh, Nobel physicist Brian Josephson off off and on for the past five five to six years and so um if we look at this paper by this talk by um professor Hiley uh of course I don't I don't you know I don't know all the details of this mathematics I don't practice mathematics I just study the concepts and I apply it. I apply it back to music theory, and so we can see this music theory here um, in the. What's What's interesting is this: his use of shadow. The shadow phase is what um, Fabio Cardoni uses in his explanation of ultrasound as uh, cold fusion. Uh, Fabio Cardoni made this sonotrode using ultrasound at 25 watts. And um, it's kind of fascinating because the human brain is also 25 watts. But it, uh, if you use ultrasound as philosophy, as the source of sound in your thinking, then you can create this um, shadow phase space <clears throat> by turning the light around internally you know, through visualization, the biophotons. So he's talking about right here, the light cone on an abstracted vector space, uh, Professor Hiley. And we'll see here that the concept of motion, the only describes the result of motion and not the motion itself. So this is very fascinating. The 
this gets into what um, Professor Holly calls um, pheronom, pheronometry, pheronometry, which is a Greek word for motion that has no cause. It's just a flowing as a going to, to and th so that so now he connects us back to the mathematics of Hamilton and then Grossman. And both Hamilton and Grossman wrote about mathematics as being the truth of thought. And this is what I was talking about with uh, perf uh, Nobel physicist Brian Josephson, because he, he's been researching the same topic about how physics actually originates from the truth, the truth of consciousness. And this is great because uh, Professor Halley, he's got like the yin yang uh, symbol of how one thought connects with another thought. And basically, he's conveying this idea of the future and the past overlapping because they're non-commutative. So you have you have a, it going from the front, the past to the future, and the future back to the past. Now, this what gets really interesting here is immediately I think of music theory. So if you think of time, and then you have the octave as one and two, and now they're the same pitch. So you can think of that as like the I thought, the source of all our thoughts is from the source of the I thought. And so the I replicates itself. But then with the third thought, you have this comparison so that the third flows back to the one, the one to the three. And this is what they call a groupoid in the mathematics. So, now, to th now the, the secret is to, s to think of that as non-commutativity. And this is what Professor Hiley does. Is he's showing that if you take that octave, but as an inverse, so now you're reversing the direction of the octave. And so you get a unity, but the unity is itself a complementary opposite in time as the future and the past overlapping. And that's what is this process of becoming that then is called an, an item potent by, um, I think, I think maybe, I don't know who's the first to use that terminology. So you have this inverse process and then, um, now, now he quotes Lou Kaufman, but of course, if we bring that back to music theory, we know exactly what that inverse process is because two thirds is the perfect fifth as an undertone, which would be C to F, whereas three halves is the perfect fifth as an overtone, which would be C to G. So just this right here, just this equation, it captures what Alain Kahn's calls two, three, infinity as the secret of the, of the foundation of reality. So it's extremely simple, yet it's very radical because it was covered up by Plato and Architas when they created um, the symmetric irrational magnitude as the origin of music theory. But if you look just at this, we have the truth of music theory as an infinite process of becoming as the yin and yang. So that so he's replicating the same concept that I've been talking that I, I originally called it complementary opposites in in music theory. But Alain Kahn's he explains the same concept in terms of music theory. And so Professor Hiley, like I said, he uses that same um, metaphor of music as an ex, you know, as a, a great example of the flowing of the future in the past, like back from the, the future reversing back into the past. And so you're, it's guiding, the future is guiding the music of the notes, the order, the ordering of the notes and time is what creates the meaning of the music, the emotional meaning Okay, so, but here we have it again, it's in terms of the symbols of mathematics. And uh, I'm not really, you know, I'm, I don't practice math, I just study the concepts. So, um, 
Oh, he's got the great quote from Einstein again. This is great because B.G. Siddharth has the same quote of Einstein. Einstein referring to the non-commutative Heisenberg method. He doesn't say it's non-commutative, but he calls it the Heisenberg method. And this would this would give us the principle of the space-time continuum. Or no, we, we must give up the symmetric space-time rest frame. That's essentially what Einstein is saying. We're going to have to give up the symmetric rest frame in order to have this purely non-commutative quantum algebra description of reality. So it's just awesome that um, Professor Hiley has this Einstein quote. Uh, just as uh, B.G. Siddharth also has in his uh, non-commutative physics analysis. Now, did they, I don't know, they, most, they must have both found this independently, both B.G. Siddharth and um, Professor Basil J. Hiley found that same Einstein quote and realized that that was the secret truth of reality that Einstein would stumbled upon it, but he hadn't really focused on it. Okay, so... And then he... Yeah, this gets back to the bit... The it from bit Wheeler concept. Not, not geometry physics, but quantum and then geometry and then physics. So it's it's another one step abstraction. So that's that's quite fascinating that the quantum non commutativity is before mathematics. And this is my whole point too, with it. That's what gets you into quantum biology, which is what um Nobel physicist Brian Josephson is emphasizing, as is um Professor Hiley, that quantum biology is actually before quantum physics. Okay, so now we're going to get into how do you how do you convert it back into commutative uh, standard physics. And of course, I don't really care about this because in the quantum biology, you are amplifying it to the macro scale. And uh, Professor Halley, he, he has been emphasizing this, using the Dirac belt as a explanation, as an example of the non-commutativity on the macro scale. He also uses the Coriolis effect. And ironically, I just discovered a um, gravito electromagnetic paper that was published recently, like in the past year, and it's also discussing the Coriolis effect as an example of um, the gravito electromagnetic, which is essentially the same secret of the non-commutative spin that's, that's non-local. So here he's just combining, he's saying, he's combining the commutative. Now he's saying, can you abstract the geometry from the com non-commutative algebra? And so now you have a, a calculus that goes backwards in time. It's a non-commutative calculus. And from this, you derive the um, square root of negative one as a non-commutative process. And this is also what um, math professor Luke Hoffman does. And, um, you know, we can take this back to the octave, the, pro the inversion of the octave being actually non-commutative. Whereas in standard f math music theory, they assume that the octave is a symmetric uh, geometry. Okay, so... The quaternions. All right, so now you're getting into the matrices um, and showing that the matrices are actually non commutative. 
and then relating that back into the circle as the calculus, the like the um, polar polar uh, geometry. And this gets you into the groupoid analysis. Yeah, here he says polar right there. And then, and you combine that with a temporal. And so then you get this same um, one plus one minus one. This is what Luke Hoffman talks about also. So this is what I would, I just call it the two thirds and three halves because the one is not a wavelength. It's a process in time as plus one minus one because the, if you have a two thirds frequency, then you have a wavelength that's three halves, but that's larger than the one as a wavelength to zero. So you have this constant um, plus one minus one because you have to have a wavelength that's changing. It's not, you can't have a zero. And this gets you back to light, to the the gravitational mass of light not, not being zero, but it, it's inherently non-commutative, non-commutative space-time. So I don't, you know, I, again, I don't do all this mathematics. I don't do the physics. I just study the concepts. And I use it as an intellectual self-defense to explain the paranormal results of the meditation training. So if you practice the this philosophy, as if you apply it to yourself as meditation, then you can resonate with the source of reality and then have a um, spiritual and paranormal um, powers that result uh, from this non-commutative source of reality. So his point here is if you just use this algebraic concept, then you can derive relativistic quantum physics with spin and you haven't even used quantum, you haven't even used the standard uh, quantum wave mechanics at all from the Schrodinger wave function. So these are the different particles, the Dirac particle, Pauli particle, Schrodinger particle. This is what um, Professor Hiley, he explains how he can drive all this just from the non-commutative algebra and it's a macro so you get a macro scale because the non-commutativity is not limited to the quantum scale because there's no collapse of the wave function and so this solves all the paradoxes of quantum physics that previously could not be explained like Richard Feynman he's just says well it's a mystery you can't understand it but um, Professor Hiley, he's proven that Richard Feynman had his mathematics wrong, and he so he covered up the non-commutative truth, and so did Dirac also. So that's why this is a true uh, revolution in uh, physics. Let's see. So here you have the item potent cut. This, this is sort of like the um, cut in um, mathematics that gets you into um, Cantor, the, the Cantor transfinite mathematics, and it, it gets you into Gödel's, Gödel's theorem, the incompleteness theorem in Gödel. This is pretty similar to that. Um, uh, I can't remember that mathematician. He... Oh, Datacon. Datacon's cut as the, that's how Datacon justified the irrational magnitude uh, logic of set theory. But then you have the uh, Bertrand Russell's paradox of the set of no sets. And uh, Eddie Oceans, he explains that you can solve that paradox by using the non-commutative quantum algebra. So it's neither a nor not a as a process um, and that's what this cut process explains 
see you changing the order of it. And so therefore, as um, math professor Luke Hoffman explains, the complex number is actually inherently non-commutative because of the square root of negative one. Whereas normal uh, standard physics assumes a complex number is a commutative geometry based on the real numbers. And there, if you can take a complex number, you can turn it into just two two sets of real numbers, and therefore you can ignore the non-commutativity, but that's not accurate. Okay, so now he's quoting Richard Feynman. And then he's taking that back to physics with light cones and this is getting getting pretty awesome here. I don't because you as soon as you get into light cones you can get into black holes and the black hole singularity. So here we have this, um, this is essentially the black hole singularity that um, Gerard de Hoof talks about also. He just, he uses the term anti-symmetric instead of um, non-commutative, but Gerard de Hoof is talking about the um, Hamiltonian complex number numbers are actually anti-symmetric uh, of the t of the feature in the past, and so that's how you get that the instanton as the microscopic black hole. That's the ether of reality. And uh, Sean Majid, Professor Sean Majid, he discusses this also. He says that the the quantum non commutativity would be an anti gravity propulsion that then cancels out the singularity of the collapse of the, um, uh, you know, from the black hole the collapse of the singularity. So you have from gravity, so you have the two canceling each other out as a quantum non-locality, or what they call the quantum donut right here. So this is what I was taught. This is from uh, Professor uh, Herbert J. Bernstein, his uh, quantum teleportation technology. It all relies on the um, non-commutative quantum donut and he taught me this as the the Dirac um belt the Dirac dance that it's the same Dirac dance that um math professor Luke Hoffman relies on with Eddie Oceans so Eddie Oceans says that's the secret of the of Tai Chi of the Tai Chi training what they call the silk reeling method in Tai Chi is you just have the yin and the yang of the upper body and lower body and the yin and the yang of the external and internal sides of the hands with the left and the right hands. And so you're activating the main energy channels of the body. Okay, so... We can again. We can think of this in terms of music theory. And what? Okay, so they're saying because that's because it's not commutative. Therefore, you have the square root of negative one as the secret of Planck's constant. Because if you put Planck's constant equaling one, therefore the average energy of light is no longer a pi over four. Or four, it's no longer a four over pi symmetric sphere, which is the assumption of the H bracket in Planck's constant. But instead you have a, which this is the squaring of the amplitude right here in, as the Born, Born rule. But 
instead what you have is a non-commutative process in the what they call the SU2 um, covering. So you think of the blocks, the block sphere actually is a two sphere. It's a quantum two sphere. Like it's a, it's actually like six dimensional. It's a five dimensional process of time and frequency that inherently can't be seen. So it's like a Klein bottle. Or you could call it like two Mobius strips connected together, or it's also called this non-commutative tori, the quantum donut as the non-commutative tori. Torus. Okay. So essentially they're just doubling up, doubling up that process of the non-commutative. So that's the phase space, but it's actually a non-commutative process. And the, so that connects the quantum, this is basically like quantum gravity, the secret of quantum gravity. Okay. So now he's getting really abstract. You know, like how do you derive points in space from the process? This is what Alon Khan also talks about as Fourier. 